feel a, a sick feeling in my stomach whenever I hear the word guru in relation to myself. Um, and some of you can probably relate to the feeling that I'm having right now, which is, um, I think, commonly called imposter syndrome, where, you know, every fiber of my being is screaming, you should not be here. <laughs> this is the time they're finally going to find out that you are a complete fraud. Um, I've also been sort of hearing from some amazing people this morning, particularly some amazing young people, and wondering what the hell I've done with the last 30 years. Because I haven't walked across Afghan Afghanistan, I haven't developed an amazing piece of new software, and I haven't set up an amazing social movement. Um, what I have done is spent a lot of time working in uh, branding and advertising, and from some of that work, I've just got a thought about something that I want to share to you, share with you. Um, one of the things that I love about TED, I was fortunate enough to go to TED in New York back in, I think it was 1998. And a lot of the things that I heard at that conference actually still resonate with me, and I'm sure this conference will be the same. But one of the things I love about TED is that um, all sorts of things start to connect up and overlap. Um, and Richard talked this morning about um, when you find your story, your story will sort of keep reflecting back to you. And for me, that what I'm going to talk about is one of those things. Um, and it actually relates quite closely to something that Divya talked about at the beginning of the afternoon when she talked about being young. Um, and clearly, I'm not particularly young any longer. Uh, so I was reassured when she said it's more of a mindset than an age thing. That's reassuring to me. But I'm really interested in, well, what actually is it about that mindset? And is there something that we can do to really ingrain that mindset? Because I fully agree with her about the value of it. So what if we valued inexperience as much as experience? Um, and that's kind of a strange proposition coming from someone like me. I'm nearly 50 years old. I'm a consultant. And I make my living out of people thinking that I'm experienced and particularly thinking that I'm expert and I know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm actually not talking specifically about being young, young and inexperienced, although that's a fabulous way to be. Um, I'm a firm believer that if I'd known at 18 what I know now, I would have had a much better time in my 20s. Um, and whilst I was definitely naive at that stage, I wasn't particularly intelligent. Um, and essentially, that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, Divya talked about neoteny, which I must admit is a new word to me and something I'm going to have to do some research on. The thing I want to talk to you about is the idea of being intelligently naive and what that actually means and the value of that and how we might be able to embed that in how we behave and how we work and actually how we live our lives. Um, Divya had a wonderful quote from Disney, and I've got a sort of similar one from... Pablo Picasso, who said, children are born artists, but the challenge is to remain an artist as you grow up. Um, and what intelligent naivety is about for me is how do we avoid the sort of deadening effects of experience? And I'm sure we've all got uh, maybe grandparents or older people that we know who you can't tell anything to. You know, their minds are closed. They're actually not capable of opening their minds, seeing things a different way, seeing something fresh. Um, and as someone who is nearly 50, I do not want to turn into one of those people. So for me, this is quite a personal quest. How do I actually stop my experience and everything that I know actually hardening into a very fixed view of the world and the way that the world can be? So for me, this whole idea of intelligent naivety started with um, Eat Big Fish. So I want to tell you a little bit about Eat Big Fish and who we are and what we do. Sorry, I'll just flick back to Pablo for a minute. Um, as Andrew said, we're a, we're a global brand consultancy. There are actually only six of us. Um, I'm called the lead partner for Eat Big Fish Australasia. In fact, I am Eat Big Fish Southern Hemisphere. There is only me. Um, <laughs> and I am Eat Big Fish Australasia because there is nobody else behind me. I have no office full of people anywhere at all. And what we do is specialize in trying to understand what it is that makes challenges, whether that's companies, brands, or people, able to compete with bigger and better resource competitors, but possibly more profoundly than that, able to actually overthrow the status quo, able to actually change things. What is it about how they think and how they behave that enables them to do that? 
Um, and from all the work that we've done studying successful challenges, uh, one of the most important things that we've found is this idea of being intelligently naive. Now, when I first started talking to Adam Morgan, who is the founder of Eat Big Fish and, a, and an old friend of mine, uh, which was after I left Saatchi's about seven years ago now, I got really excited by the idea of challenges in the context of New Zealand, because if anyone knows about challenges, we do. It's, you know, it's in our DNA, it informs the way that we think about the world, even something like the hacker is fundamentally based on challenge. So we know all about being challenges, and one of the interesting things we found um, in working in all sorts of markets around the world is that some countries naturally gravitate to the idea of being challenges, and others don't. So India, for example, they love the idea of being challenges. It's very, I did a big project up in India a couple of years ago, and it was fantastic. Um, if you go to China, they're actually not so keen on the challenger idea. They are much keener on the idea of leadership and the idea of compliance than the idea of challenging. The West Coast of America is home to many more challenges than the East Coast of America. You might think like a, that a country like Portugal, for example, which is a small country next to a big one, rather like us, would naturally be challenges. Actually, they're not. Maybe that's to do with the experience of empire that they had. Don't know. So, Challenger is actually not so much about little versus big. It's actually more a state of mind than it is a state of market or a state of size. But we are definitely naturally challengers. Um, but I think what we, one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, the, the idea of us as the little battler is, you know, pretty much ingrained in our culture. But how do we actually go beyond that? So how do we take advantage of the fact that we are challengers, we have this natural affinity with the idea of being challengers, and actually develop a much more nuanced view of what that means? So actually turn that into something that is actionable. Again, a, a sort of a great theme from today. Um, when I was at Saatchi's, uh, we had a, a fantastic program that was called Artist in Residence, which was in itself a way of bringing intelligent naivety into the agency. And what that meant was that every couple of months or so, we would invite somebody into the agency to work with us who had nothing at all to do with advertising. So we had a guy, um, Otis Frizzell, who is a hip hopper and a um, graffiti artist. He came and did some work with us. We had an anthropologist. And we also had a fantastic woman called Rebecca Webster, who's a clinical psychologist. And one of the things that Rebecca got really fascinated by was the actual psychology of the agency itself and what made us work as an agency and particularly what made us a particularly fertile creative environment. And, when she, and she worked with us, I think, for about two or three months altogether. And when she left, she wrote that up as a thing called the shrink wrap, which was fantastic. Um, and one of the things that I loved most about it was the thing, some of the things that she identified as being absolutely critical to the way we worked as an agency were things that we took completely for granted, that we hadn't even noticed that we'd done, that we didn't place any particular value on, and we certainly hadn't tried to actually embed in the agency in any formal way. And it really made us think about some of those things and think about how could we actually make sure that we don't lose them and how do we actually try and amplify them. And I wonder whether intelligent naivety isn't one of those things for us as New Zealanders. Um, I've got a great friend who talks about uh, New Zealand as a country with most of its history ahead of us. And being someone who comes from Europe, I love the idea of that. I love the sense of possibility and liberation and openness that that involves. And so I actually think part of the reason why the, the challenger idea resonates with us is because we as a country actually do have a young mindset. And so what I'm interested in is as we grow up, how do we actually hang on to that? How do we embed that as part of what we're about? Um, now, the thing about challenges is that they are companies, countries or whatever, with um, big ambitions and limited resources. And the wonderful thing about that is that I have yet to talk to a company who at this point say, well, you see, that doesn't really apply to us because we've got, tiny we've got tiny ambitions and massive resources. There isn't a company in the world that's going to sign up to that. So that relates to just about everybody. The difference with challenges is that they understand that if you're actually going to bridge the gap between ambition and resources, 
you are going to have to do things differently. You're going to have to change the rules of the game and in a way that actually favors you and the way that you operate. So we use this sort of analogy of if the contest there is do you want to fight, then it's not that difficult to pick who the winner is going to be. If you change the terms of the contest to do you want to race, well, that rate, that's probably going to have a different outcome. And that's what challengers are really good at doing, is changing the terms of the game so that they turn into their favor. So that's fine. It's easy to say, OK, all you need to do is change the rules of the game. But how the hell do you do that? That's really hard to do. How do you do that in a way which means that you will succeed, you will be profitable, and you change the rules of the game in your favor? And even more importantly, how do you sustain that once you have changed the rules of the game and everybody's now playing your game? How do you then move on from that? And that's really the focus of what I want to talk about. Part of that is about what do you decide to overcommit to? And in order to overcommit to something, what therefore do you sacrifice? And that's something that challengers are really good at doing. What are we overcommitting to? What are we going to sacrifice? And it's a bit like that old karate thing of, um, you know, if you're going to get through the brick, you have to aim three feet below the brick. Challengers are really good at that. So when we started doing a lot of our research at Eat Big Fish, one of the things that struck us was that many of the most iconic challenger brands that you can think of were started by people who had no experience within the industry that they went into. So if you think of someone like Jeff Bezos, for example, he wasn't a bookseller. He wasn't a retailer when he started Amazon. Uh, Richard Branson wasn't in airlines when he started Virgin Atlantic. In fact, he still doesn't think of himself as being in airlines. He thinks of himself as being in the entertainment business. Um, and Jeff Ross, who was a colleague of mine at Saatchi's, where he, unbeknown to any of us, had already started 42 Below, wasn't in the vodka business when he started 42 Below. So is that, a, is that an accident, or is that actually part of what being a challenger is about? Um, my favorite story of intelligent naivety concerns a guy called Ian Schrager, who those of you who are about my vintage may have heard of. He was one of the guys who founded a, an infamous nightclub in New York called Studio 54, back in New York in the 70s, um, which used to attract people like Andy Warhol, Truman Capote, Mick Jagger. It sounds like it would have been fantastically good fun. Um, but uh, unfortunately for Mr. Schrager, he ultimately ended up in jail thanks to tax evasion. And the story goes that while he was in jail, he won a hotel in a poker game. And when he left jail, uh, that was the only asset that he had. And it was the Paramount Hotel, which is in Chelsea in Manhattan. So he went to look at it on a rainy, well, let's say Wednesday afternoon, rainy Walked in, there's nothing much going on, there's a few people hanging around in the lobby, nothing much going on. And he walked in and thought, well, this is kind of weird because all the, month, the, the then hotel model, what everybody knew about hotels was that the, the place that you spent the money was in the rooms. Wasn't, the lobby was just a place to check in, hang out for a cab on a rainy day, whatever. It certainly wasn't an important part of the overall experience. And because he didn't know anything about what everybody knows about hotels, he looked at the lobby and thought, this is prime real estate, Chelsea. Why wouldn't you make the lobby into the, th into the thing that people come to a hotel for? Why wouldn't you flip the business model entirely and say, we're going to spend all the money on the lobby, and we're not really going to bother too much about the rooms? And I don't know if any of you stayed at the Paramount, but the rooms are literally you could not swing a cat in them. You have to climb over the bed to get to the bathroom. You can't even walk around the bed. That's how small the rooms are. So what he did was to say, right, I'm going to make the lobby into what he called the nightclub of the 90s. I'm going to put in a fabulous bar. It's going to be full of young and beautiful people, including the staff. Um, the downside of that was that sometimes you could get a drink and sometimes you couldn't. And probably at my age now, I'd be completely invisible to them, so I wouldn't go there at all. Um, but he completely flipped that model, and, has now, and that's now become, if you think of places like the W, that's now become the model. So the idea was, I would go to the Paramount, the Mondrian, the Standard, the Hudson, wherever it is, and you go primarily for the lobby and the scene that's going on in the lobby. And it also attracts people locally as well. So fantastically successful. This is the lobby of the Hudson in New York, a place I will no longer ever get to enter since I left the corporate lifestyle. So 
What all of these people had in common, Jeff Bezos, Jeff Ross, Ian Schrager, was that they were able to change the rules because they didn't know what the rules were. So in that sense, it's kind of easy to be intelligently naive because you just don't know what the rules are. The difficulty is to remain intelligently naive. How do you do that? Um, now, some of you may have seen a film uh, called Gorillas and Basketball. Basketballs, it's an awareness test. Has anyone seen that film? Okay, so a few of you have. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to show it because it's, it's all um, copy, copyrighted, copywritten, whatever. Um, and I couldn't get permission to show you it. But if I briefly describe what happens. It's essentially you've got four people wearing white shirts, four people wearing black shirts. And what you're asked to do during the course of the film is to count the number of passes. They're, they've got basket, a basketball that they're throwing. Count the number of passes that the white team makes to each other. So the film plays. You try and count the number of passes. And when it's and the film lasts, I don't know, two minutes maybe, minute, two minutes. Um, and when it's over, you're asked how many passes. And most people get within one or two. And then you're asked whether you saw the gorilla that walked across in the middle of the game. And only about 50% of people actually spot the gorilla. And when you play the film back, it's glaringly obvious that a guy in a gorilla suit walks into the middle of the game, goes like that, <laughs> and walks off the other side. And you look at him and think, how the hell could I have missed that? But that's what happens when you lose intelligent naivety. You become very focused on the things you're looking for, and you can completely ignore other things. Um, so intelligent naivety, I think Divya talked about this as well, the idea of, a, of it being a muscle. It's actually something that you have to work at. You don't have to work at it when you're 18, particularly, or even when you're 25. By the time you get to my age, you really have to work at it, because every th the conformity and expertise has almost a gravitational pull that's kind of dragging you in. If you're going to resist that, you've actually got to do something active about it. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just, oh, sorry, I forgot that one. That's what I was re referring to there. This is, <laughs> this is a favorite thing of Adam's, where what one of, if those of you who work in marketing and things like that, um, there's an awful lot of talk about insights. We've got to find insights. We need rich insights. We've got to mine the data for insights. Um, insights are seen as being incredibly valuable, and they are, because they are actually the bedrock, the, the raw material for um, ideas and innovation. Um, but the, if you think back to the gorillas and basketball thing, it's actually really hard to see insights when you're quite locked into how you think. Um, and Adam has got this saying, which he says, insights are a bit like giant pandas. Very rare, hard to find, and often, um, sorry, I've completely forgotten it. <laughs> Very rare, hard to find, and often frustratingly infertile. <laughs> Thank God you laughed, otherwise I wouldn't have thought that was worth waiting for at all. Um, so if intelligent naivety is, what, is really what drives insights, and that's really our contention that, you, that it's very difficult to have fresh, fertile insights without being intelligently naive, and it's a muscle that you've got to work, then how do you do that? And, how does that, and so what I want to show you initially are some examples from the world of brands and advertising, and then I'm going to sort of widen it out from there. So just for a moment, I want to take you out of the hall and lift you up high into the universe and talk a little bit about something called the Mephisto Waltz, which is um, an astronomical phenomenon. I'm a little bit nervous about talking about it when Ken's here, because he knows a hell of a lot more about astronomy than I do. But it's, as I understand it, it's when two um, giant black holes come into each other's gravitational fields. And what happens is that they start dancing around each other, and they get closer and closer and closer until eventually they collapse into one giant black hole. And we see this happening a lot in the world of brands. So one toothpaste company will do toothpaste with baking soda. The other one does toothpaste with baking soda. Whitening strips, whitening strips. They just end up copying each other. Here's an example of from cough medicine, four different brands. But you can see how, clo how, how strongly established the conventions are there. And this is my personal favorite one. Believe it or not, th those are ads for six different brands of foundation. So, you know, what everybody knows about selling foundation is you need a pretty skinny white girl with a dewy complexion, doe eyes, possibly head slightly cocked on one side, and that's the way you sell foundation. <laughs> but 
The great thing about the Mephisto Waltz, if, if for any aspiring challengers out there, look out for Mephisto Waltzes, because that is a sure indicator of opportunity, because that's a great opportunity to do something different. So within this context, the people who, who used this as a fantastic context for them were Mac when they launched, because they picked a black drag artist to be their spokesperson. So the absolute antithesis of the normal spokesperson. Um, so the thing with challenges is that's fine to be intelligent and naive when you start out, but what happens when you're two or three years down the line and you actually aren't intelligent and naive any longer, you've changed the rules, everybody else is now playing to your rules, and you're possibly caught up in your own Mephisto waltz. What do you do then? Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, improvisation. And I'm sure you've all seen um, programs like Whose Line is it, is it Anyway, and maybe you've seen theatre sports here in New Zealand. And the thing I love about improv is the idea that um, we're always getting offers. So an offer can be what someone says, a gesture, a prop, but essentially that we're always getting offers. And what improv artists do on stage is to use all of the offers that they get from other actors that they're working with or from the audience or whatever, or suggestions, and they make a story out of those. Um, and if an improviser has a predetermined story that they're trying to force everything to fit, then they look wooden and it flops. So being an improviser means using everything that's happening around you and being in the moment. You can't have a story that you're sticking to if you're going to be a successful improviser. And it strikes me that life is actually quite a lot like that. If we have a predetermined idea of the way we think things are going to be, whether that's our work, our relationships, whatever, then we're almost certainly going to be disappointed. Um, back in the 80s, I got quite seduced by the idea of scenario planning. And we used to, I used to do quite a lot of work with clients where we'd plan out, you know, battle plan different scenarios. And when I think about it now, it all seems rather quaint. You know, the idea that there were four potential scenarios and we could plan for each of them and then it would be fine and we didn't have to worry anymore. We wouldn't waste our time doing that these days. So it strikes me that improvisation is possibly uh, more important than just four actors on stage singing a song in the style of Dolly Parton, you know, using a traffic cone as a cone. I think it's possibly more important than that. So what intelligent naives do is they choose to recognize more offers. It's not that they get more offers, but they recognize them and they choose to actually do something with them. So my friend Rob, who's a, um, one of the guys who founded a company called On Your Feet, which is a company based in Spain and the US that specializes in applying improv to vis business. He's got three really simple rules for being good at improv, which I think actually are the foundation for, for remaining intelligently naive. Um, I love Divya's idea about you know, hanging out with young people more, but if you do that at my age, you're gonna be called a cougar. That's not a good thing. <laughs> So I want to leave you just with these three thoughts. So the first one is the idea of letting go. Um, and letting go can be really hard to do. Um, I'm really interested in Buddhist philosophy. And one of the things that Buddhists talk a lot about is the idea of attachment. And it took me a long time to wrap my head around what that meant. Did that may mean that, you know, as a Buddhist, I couldn't love anybody, or what did that mean? And what I now understand is that if we become very attached to our stories about the way things should be, then we suffer as a result of that. So if I'm attached to a story about the way my life should be, or my relationship should be, or my body should be, I will suffer because the story will not match up with reality. So when I was 18, for example, I was extremely attached to the idea of looking like Farrah Fawcett Majors, which, as you can see, was never going to happen. Little plump Irish girl with dark hair and pale skin was never going to look like Farrah Fawcett Majors. But I really suffered for the fact that I didn't. It was not fair. Why couldn't I be blonde and have long legs and be tanned and look good in a red swimsuit? <coughs> so attachment is letting go is really about trying to detach from our stories about what's going on. And I think that's as relevant in the business world as it is in our personal lives. If we're able to detach, from our stories, or at least see them as stories, then we can actually notice more. We can actually see the gorilla and not just the guys passing the basketballs. So one is contingent on the other. And it's not just about noticing more. I also personally try and listen more 
So one of the things that I try and practice is actually really listening to people. We call it active listening. Not just waiting for someone to stop talking so you can tell them what you think, but actually listening to what people are saying. And then the final part of it is using everything. So using everything that's happening, all the offers that you're getting all of the time, some of which may feel a bit uncomfortable. So I ran a workshop recently, and most people were sort of quite into it, and there was one guy who was sitting there, you know, like this, completely not engaged. He was actually making me an offer. So I could either block the offer and choose to ignore him, or I could say, okay, Dave, so what's, what are you thinking? And he told me what he was thinking, which wasn't, you know, exactly a rave review for what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> But from what he said, we actually, he actually sparked a whole other train of thought, which proved to be extremely fruitful, which got him engaged. He introduced a completely new idea into the room. So by accepting that offer, I got a very good result. So I'm out of time. Um, what I want to leave you with is just, and this is really, this idea of intelligent naivety is something that we're working on at the moment. Like, what does it actually mean? What are the stories about it? How would we actually start to embed it? Um, so, you can reach me on kate at eatbigfish.com or go onto our website. I'd really love to hear any ideas that you've got. Um, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.